It's truly a great honor to be invited to be part of this program. Um, I was involved with the IAEA a number of years ago, writing guidelines for prostate cancer treatment in developing worlds, and we talked about the role of HDR, the potential use in that setting. I'm not going to talk about HDR today. Um, I want to focus on external beam radiation, and I want to talk about, there was a lot of discussion earlier about whether we should consider leapfrogging ahead. I think there are some things that we want to leapfrog ahead to do, and there are other things that we don't want to leapfrog ahead to do. So I'm going to spend a little bit on the history of external beam radiotherapy for prostate cancer. I'm going to talk about 3D conformal radiation, and I will be the term that we use IMRT, or intensity modulated radiation. But actually, there, this is, we've used, you hear people throw this term around, but there's no consensus as to how to define what IMRT actually is. Um, there are scientific definitions, there are medical definitions, there are commercial definitions, uh, so I'll touch on that. Whether IMRT is really better than 3D conformal radiation, uh, really the take home message if you fall asleep for the rest of my talk is that I really think that we talk about resources. I think it's really important that the radiation oncologists understand how to use the technology. A person can get better treatment with 3D conformal radiation in some settings than IMRT. Just because somebody buys a fancy piece of equipment, if they don't understand how to use it, it's not going to result in better treatment. And there are opportunities for more harm, certainly more expense. Talking about prostate cancer, what dose of radiation do we need? I'm just going to touch on that. That's not a big topic. Uh, dose versus accuracy. Patients will frequently say to me, oh, this machine is more accurate than another machine, the protons are more accurate than this. The accuracy has nothing to do, they're, they're, your machines can be accurate, but the delivery isn't controlled by how accurate the machine is. It depends on where you put the radiation, and more importantly, how the volumes are drawn. So what people don't talk about is that if you take five experts and you give them 10 different patients and you say draw the prostate, you get different prostates. And the variation from doctor to doctor is far greater than the variations associated with some of these equip this equipment that people were talking about. Uh, and then the issue of standard of care. Now why uh, am I talking about prostate cancer? Well, most people would say, well, that's kind of obvious. That's what I talk about usually when I'm talking places. <laughs> But actually, uh, prostate cancer is a problem uh, in the developing world. And these are some uh, cancer statistics from 2008, uh, published by the American Cancer Society. And what you can see is on, 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 the, on your left uh, are the cases, uh, the, the first and second most common cases. And you can see prostate cancer uh, right there for middle, uh, for, for middle Africa. Um, and then prostate here in Western Africa, and then in terms of deaths, uh, in, at least in two places, it's the second most common cause of death. And the, as the developing world adopts some of the Western lifestyle, I predict this is going to go up. If we look for it, it's going to go up. It happened in Asia, in Japan, and China. The incidence of uh, prostate cancer is just skyrocketing. So this is going to be increasingly a problem. As a life expectancy goes up, it's going to be a problem. And uh, so this is a significant tumor burden for this population. Uh, now, how did I get into the business of, of, of prostate cancer? Well, this is a picture of two uh, famous uh, prostate experts, Dr. Malcolm Bagshaw and Patrick Walsh. Now, Dr. Bagshaw is a radiation oncologist who, when I was a, a medical student at Stanford and a resident, he was my chairman. And he had the largest experience in the world treating localized prostate cancer when I was a young uh, resident. I had hair and everything, and um, uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, and this is, he got an award for this work. And his work, the work at Stanford uh, on linear accelerators goes back to the 50s. Again, this is, the, this is a fixed beam. 
The discussion earlier was about fixed beam Linux. They, they were around in the 50s. People got rid of them because they wanted to have what came later on were gantry-based systems. So for those of you in the audience who are not radiation oncologists, the issue is do you want to be able to put a patient on the table and have the machine go around the patient, or do you want to have a machine that, that's fixed? Uh, and um, early on in this pioneering work that Dr. Bagshaw did, um, he noticed that if he used blocks, so you can see uh, prior to the mid-70s, some of these were unblocked fields, and he looked at the complication rates from radiation. Intestinal would mean rectal bleeding, that sort of thing. Uh, urologic would mean bleeding from the bladder or urinary symptoms. When they started to apply blocks, that is, you block some of the, the, the radiation to prevent it from going to normal tissues near the prostate, they started to see the complication rate go down. And then in the United States, the first FDA-approved 3D planning system was in the 80s. It was developed at the University of Michigan. And this just shows um, how, um, from a side view, if you see the prostate and the seminal vesicles, the seminal vesicles are like two little rabbit ears that stick off the top of the prostate, that you can shape the beam around the prostate. Prior to that, people used square fields. They will use a standard field size, eight by eight, nine by nine, in some places 10 by 10 initially, and there were no blocks applied. This is what became called a beam's eye view. So you take a CAT scan, you reconstruct the prostate in three dimensions, and then you can design ways to, to make the block so that the stuff in the middle here is what you're radiating, and the stuff that's being blocked is out here. So you can see that in the slice here, you have the bladder, you have the prostate, seminal vesicles here, and these beams are coming in from all these different directions, and they're blocking the normal tissues. They're blocking the rectum, they're blocking the penis, they're blocking uh, the bladder. And this early pioneer work that was done by a physicist, uh, largely uh, uh, Randy Tenhocken, he was able to compare different techniques, six fields, a four field box, bilateral arcs. If the bilateral arcs covered the target volume, these numbers refer to how much additional area gets radiated. You want it to be a, a smaller number as possible because when you increase the radiation beyond the target, you give more radiation to normal tissues and you don't want to have the normal tissues radiated if you could avoid it. If you use the standard type of radiation, eight by eight, for example, it had a low value, but you had partial coverage. You don't want to miss the cancer either. So if you miss the cancer, the patient is likely to, uh, the cancer is likely to come back. And we have these fancy ways of comparing, this is called a dose volume histogram. The dose is here, the volume's here. And you, when you cover 100% of the volume, you get a curve up here. When you start to miss stuff, you get a curve down here. This is bad because you want to cover the prostate. On the other hand, this is looking at the rectal wall. So when you have a man getting radiation for prostate cancer, you don't want the rectum to get a lot of radiation because the patient can have bleeding, they can have pain, uh, diarrhea. And so in this case, you want to be down here. And here, uh, with these newer techniques, you could bring the curve down here. So you want to cover all the cancer, and you want to spare as much normal tissue um, as possible. And in a paper that, Dr. <clears throat> that Randy Tenhocken wrote years ago, this is what we call a lateral beam's eye view. So you have the pubic bone here, the prostate's in here, and this is what's being blocked. These lines correspond to blocks being pl placed here, and in this case, there's a, f uh, a, a balloon that has ca contrast that we call a Foley catheter, which is in here. This is a very common way for us to treat prostate cancer uh, back in the 80s. The problem was that Randy noted was that the prostate position changes. So every day when a man comes in for radiation, uh, we used to, when I was a young resident, assume that the prostate was in the same position every day relative to the bones. 
and we would deliver the entire treatment based on that assumption. But Randy was really the first person. These, uh, these two CAT scans are taken at the exact same level. If you look at the way the bones look here, the bones look the same. But in this case, there's contrast in the rectum, and in this case, there's not. And the prostate position is different. This patient happens to have calcification, these little white spots in his prostate, and you see them differently here than you do here because his prostate is in a different position. And this is a lateral beam's eye view. This is the rectum that's dilated, corresponding to this area where the contrast is here. And here, uh, up here, the rectum is not dilated. This, this, this line that's going around the prostate, this is the way the radiation field was drawn. So you could see that on here, you would start to miss part of the prostate because it's sticking out beyond the line. And in this case, you would be treating a large, much larger portion of the rectum uh, because of the change in the anatomy. So around that time, shortly thereafter, um, we also were attempting to try to figure out better ways to target the prostate. The standard way prostate cancer used to be treated when I was a young resident was that we placed the lower border of the field at the bottom of these bones. These are called the ischia tuberosities. The prostate sits normally right in here. In fact, uh, from Washington University in St. Louis did a lot of the pioneering work. There was a Dr. Pilipich who wrote a classic paper on 100 consecutive patients that had CAT scans, and everybody didn't have CAT scans in the 1980s. So many of the techniques that we used in those days would be relevant to people that are trying to treat cancer patients that don't have access to all the technology. And so the question is, what would you do if you didn't have a CAT scan machine and you had a linear accelerator, or, or if you didn't have intensity modulated radiation, you just had 3D, and some of us have a lot of experience treating patients like that. So this is a, patient, a paper that we wrote on urethrograms. What we used to do is we would take contrast, put it in a syringe, and shoot it right up the penis, and there's a, the external sphincter. There's a, there's a valve that sits right here below the prostate, between the prostate and the, at the bottom of the prostate to prevent the urine from leaking out. And that external sphincter is variably positioned. So in this particular patient, if you were to place the lower border of the field at the lower border of the issue tuberosity, you would have a margin around the bottom of the prostate, which would be sitting in here, which would be adequate for purposes of treating the patient. On the other hand, if you, treated, if you, uh, if you uh, put the margin here, you can see this patient's prostate is lower because that's where the external sphincter is. In this case, you would miss the bottom part of the prostate because there's not enough margin around the lower part of the field. In this case, the prostate is much higher. And what, what would happen here is that if you put the bottom of the field at the lower border of the issue tuberosity, you would radiate the man's penis to a full dose of radiation, which is not a good thing. Okay, so we started to understand the anatomy better, uh, beginning in the, the fact that the prostate moves, where the prostate's positioned. Again, we used to use very crude uh, techniques. Then, as 3D conformal radiation came along, we tried to def define what are the margins that you should put around the prostate to get the best coverage of the prostate. Now, part of the take-home message of my talk is that this is not really about prostate cancer. This is about when you're designing your radiation for treating a patient, you need to figure out what beam arrangements should you use, what margins should you use, what are the things you should think about when you start to develop that kind of technique. So back in those days, when we were first playing with 3D conformal radiation, we did a study, for example, we wanted to take the six fields that Dr. Tenhocken had published. Six fields mean one from the front, one from the back, an anterior oblique from the right, anterior oblique from the left, a lateral from the right, a lateral from the left, posterior oblique from the left and right. Um, and so you had all these beams that you would put around patients and you wanted to figure out 
which of the beams, you know, how should they be weighted? Should you get half of the radiation from this beam? What should the beam angles be between the oblique fields and the lateral fields? Um, so for a six field technique, typically you don't use the front and back, you just use the obliques and the laterals. So in this case, we did a study where we looked at 20 degrees, 25 degrees, 30 degrees, 35 degrees, 40 degrees, and 45 degrees between the lateral field and the obliques to try to figure out which of the beam angles works best. And it turned out that after we did this and we looked at doses to normal tissues, we found a number of things which make common sense. If the posterior obliques became too horizontal, uh, the density of the bone would cause the beams to be attenuated, thereby underdosing the bottom part of the prostate. So if you start to move, the, uh, the horizontal would be this way, because you're laying on a table. Uh, if you move those beams around, the pelvic bones start to get in the way, and so you have to add a bigger margin, which means you're increasing the dose to the rectum and to the penis and stuff like that. On the other hand, uh, if you moved it too vertically, you moved it to this direction, because the beams are going front and back, you start to put too much dose to the bladder and the rectum. And so we went through this exercise and we concluded that 35 degrees provided the best coverage. You got a lower rectal dose, lower bladder dose than 30, 40, 45, and better doses to the femoral, to the bones than 20, 25, and 30. The point here is that you can figure out what we call class solutions when you do treatment planning. Unfortunately, our residents don't usually do this anymore. They draw the volumes and they give this to a dosimetrist and the dosimetrist throws beams on whatever way they want to throw a beam on and then they put in an inverse planning system. They run calculations and they come up with a plan and they say, okay, here's the patient. But if you pick the wrong beam angles, you can get a worse plan with IMRT than 3D. The classic example would be if you use beams that go front to back, then you can't spare the bladder and the rectum because you've got to go through the bladder and the rectum with a front to back field. So if your dosimetrist picks the wrong beam angles, you're going to get a poor quality plan. And this is when I talk about not necessarily leapfrogging away ahead to new technology. You, you need to understand that some beam angles are better than other beam angles. And there are some issues related to coverage that are very important um, that you have to be aware of. So back in those days, we wanted to, we were looking at things like, uh, you know, whether we should use a one CM margin, a one and a half CM margin, um, and whether we should use four fields or six fields, or what we call ideal margins. So these ideal margins, we, we, now this is a, another example of a dose volume histogram. You can see that if you use a 1 CM margin, the dose to 40% of the rectum is about half of the dose. But if you go from a 1 CM margin to a uh, 1.5 CM margin, the dose jumps up tremendously. And if you go to a 2 CM margin, it jumps way up. The point is that when you have margins that are too large, you increase the dose to the normal tissues much more than you would expect because the volume is a function of the radius cube. So every time you add a little bit more margin around the tumor, you increase the doses to surrounding tissues a lot. So you want to use the smallest margin possible. Now in those days, um, the problem was that people usually used to use uniform margins. When I got into the prostate business, everybody would say, my dosimetrist would say, what margin do you want? You say one centimeter, two centimeters, they put two centimeters everywhere. So we came up with this idea of what we call ideal margins, which were supposed to be a margin that balances the risk and the benefits that make the margins bigger in some places and smaller in other places. And so here's the idea. Here's the prostate. Here's the rectum. 
If you put a uniform margin all the way around the thing, you can see that if this is the high dose area, high radiation dose, each one of these um, letters corresponds to a different dose. The higher dose is closer and next, and we call this in the field penumbra. And so this might be 90%, 60%, 20%. So you'd see that this rectal wall is going to catch part of that 90% of the dose because we're using a uniform margin. On the other hand, if we made the margin bigger on the front and bigger on the side and tighter on the back, none of the 90% would hit the rectum in this case and you would have just the low dose area hitting it. And so when you look at this dose distribution, we would say, okay, um, we don't have to worry about complications lateral. So you don't hurt a patient when you have a little bit of dose of radiation that goes a little bit to the left or to the right of the prostate or a little bit in front of the prostate. The complications come from the radiation going behind the prostate hitting the rectum. Now to do this, we said the patients should be simulated, that is when you do the planning, with their rectum empty. So we told our residents all the patients have to have their bladder as full as possible and their rectum as empty as possible at the beginning of treatment. Now, not everybody adopted that kind of, 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 of strategy. Now, um, this slide got out of order. Um, and this is just showing some of the, uh, the uh, again, the prostate cancer uh, uh, rates. Anyway, so we, so going back over 20 years ago, we said, you should put a generous margin in front of the prostate and the side of the prostate, but tight behind the prostate, but the rectum should be empty. We never proved this in a patient. However, years later, 10 years later, paper, patient, paper published from MD Anderson showed that if you simulated the patient, if you did their planning with the rectum empty, so this is a lateral field, the prostate's here, the pubic bone is here, the sacrum's here, this black area represents air in the rectum. They found that when you did the planning CAT scan for this patient, if their rectum was full of air, they had a much worse outcome. This is the stended rectum. This is the biochemical control rate. So if the, if the rectum was distended at the time the scan was taken, the patients had a worse cancer outcome. Well, why did that happen? because once you started radiating the patient, the rectum became empty and the prostate moved back. And so you were missing the prostate. So again, the principles, IMRT cannot fix that problem. The physician has to understand that you wanna make sure that when the scan is obtained, the rectum's empty, the position of the patient's important. There's been controversy about whether the patient should be treated laying on their stomach which we call prone, or whether they lay on their back, which we call supine. And when you put a patient on their stomach and you treat them for prostate cancer, when they breathe, the prostate moves more. And also patients, at least in San Francisco, tend to be round on the front and flat on the back. So when you put a patient on their stomach, they tend to roll, but if you treat them on their back, they tend to be more stable. So these are things that you're, you know, the, the physicists don't really address these issues. The doctors have to address these issues. Now, we started, uh, again, uh, playing with the concept of IMRT uh, many years ago, more than 20 years ago, but this was the first uh, old form of sort of IMRT. This was a six-field technique. We used to draw the shape of the beam on the patient's body for each of the beam angles we would have these transparencies that were generated by a computer. They would print out these plastic sheets and then we would tape these on the top of plain x-rays. This isn't done anymore, at least anywhere I'm aware of. This is an anterior oblique. This is a, an anterior oblique. This is the right femur and the pubic bone. And then as a form of intensity modulated radiation, before we really used the term intensity modulated radiation, we also gen uh, generated what's called a partial transmission block. So we actually had our block, back in those days, people used to cut lead blocks. 
and that's how you would protect the tissues around the prostate. Now with IMRT, we use multi-leaf collimation, but you can do intensity modulated radiation using blocks. It is possible. So this is an example of that. We would have our block cutter. These areas are full thickness blocks, and right at the edges here, this is a partial transmission block. That would prevent the hot spot from the radiation from ending up in the, in the anterior rectal wall. When you have oblique angle, angles, as the oblique beams tend to come in, especially in an area where there's liable to be air, there was a tendency for the posterior part when near the rectal wall to receive a hot spot. And so by putting this partial block here, we could att attenuate the dose a little bit. And so we, uh, we, we then went on, and I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this next set of slides except to say that we were trying to figure out um, how, do you, how can you determine what a safe dose of radiation would be. So this, is, this was something that we call the critical volume tolerance method, which we published years ago, which is if you don't know what is a safe, if you go from an old technique to a new technique when you use um, old-fashioned cobalt or whatever, and now you're using, if you get access to IMRT or 3D, what are the, if, you, if your experience as a practitioner is only with one technique, how would you apply it? And the, the basic principle here is that you reconstruct the treatment using the old technique in a 3D planning system, and then you use that to set the dose constraints. Uh, and this is an example of that. So back over 20 years ago now, or close to 20 years ago now, um, we uh, would, the SUH stands for Stanford University Hospital. This was a, a line that corresponds to the volumes to normal tissues and for a certain dose of radiation for prostate cancer. And these other lines corresponded to whether we assume we could increase the dose by 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%, and so forth. And we decided that based on our historical experience using the old-fashioned Stanford technique, we could increase the dose by 10%. So the point is that you can use old information to teach yourself about new things, but if you start from scratch, uh, then you may not have access to that information. And I'm gonna skip the next couple of slides. Um, but someone asked me on the break about MRIs. Did I do MRIs on all of our patients? And we don't do MRIs on all of our patients. I don't think you need MRIs to treat prostate cancer well, but if you have it, you can use it. Uh, we first, MRI is more accurate. Uh, this is from uh, the first paper we wrote back in 1996. When you use a CAT scan to define the prostate, the blue line is the prostate defined on a CAT scan, and the light color line is the prostate defined on an MRI. The bottom line is that the prostate looks bigger on a CAT scan than it does on an MRI, although you can train people to uh, get the volumes to correspond to one another. Because what we did here is that we looked at why did the prostate look bigger on CAT scan than on MRI? And the reason was the uh, levator anti muscles, people tended to include those as part of the apex of the prostate, sometimes soft tissue in front of the prostate, um, anteriorly, look, they were vessels, they looked like prostate. So this anterior rectal wall and the levator anti muscles, it's best seen here in a sagittal image, tended to make the prostate look bigger. And I was at a meeting once where very famous prostate cancer expert was showing an example. So I think it's more important, if somebody had a choice between having a good understanding of the anatomy and a 3D planning system, or a bad understanding of the anatomy and IMRT, give me good understanding of the anatomy in 3D any day. So these are things that don't cost a lot of money. These are things that can determine how accurately the treatment is delivered, and I think are really key to improving quality of care. Now again, it's sort of moving forward, we showed, we meaning the field of radiation oncology, this is a study from the UK where they compared conformal radiation to conventional radiation. So conventional radiation back in 1999 meant square rectangular fields. Conventional radiation now in the United States 
probably means IMRT almost in most places. But the point is that this study was a randomized study that showed that by using uh, conformal, this is 3D conformal, that you reduce the risk of rectal bleeding and proctitis compared to using conventional radiation. But I would argue that if we were to do a randomized trial and replace this conventional with 3D and this conformal with IMRT, the differences are liable to be smaller. So there was a curve that was shown earlier today by uh, John Holland uh, from Varian, and there was a curvature in that, in that line. There's a steep improvement when you go from old equipment without using CT, using just rectangular fields, to 3D, that's a huge jump. But from 3D to IMRT, the differences become smaller, and as you start to get even higher up, uh, the differences start to get smaller, except for the issue of image guidance. I think image guidance was the next major breakthrough that really helped out. And uh, looking at um, a study from Wash U, uh, Dr. Amami's from, he was back there in those days. Um, when they looked at their parameters for things that predicted better outcome, it was 3D versus standard radiation. So if you're giving radiation, you really want to be able to do 3D uh, for anything except the most palliative uh, radiation treatment. Now why is this so important? Well, there's, I talked about rectal bleeding, I talked about bladder injury, there's also um, issues related to quality of life, erectile function. This is from a study that we did years ago where we first uh, focused on the fact that with traditional uh, planning, this is, this is called the, what we call the bulb of the penis. So inside the patient, uh, just below the prostate. So here's the prostate, the penis is here, the pubic bone is here, the bladder is here, the rectum is here. This area um, is what we call the bulb and it turns out that when you give high dose radiation to the prostate, uh, which is here, if you put too much margin below the bottom of the prostate and you irradiate the penis, you probably injure the nerves and the blood supply which sit on either side and that means that the man's ability to have sex will be compromised more by the radiation than necessary. And we um, did a study, a phase one, two study called RTOG 9406 where we compared patients who received more than 52 gray uh, to the bulb versus those that got less, and it almost doubled the risk that a patient would develop erectile dysfunction if you um, unnecessarily, and you can treat prostate cancer fine in a curative way uh, without radiating the bulb of the penis. And there's clearly, uh, we believe, evidence for what we call a dose response curve. The more radiation you give to that area, the higher the risk of severe erectile dysfunction. So back in 2000 when we were writing guidelines for the American College of Radiology, in those days 3D conformal radiation was the new standard of care. Uh, we wrote on them in 96, we wrote them in 2000. If you couldn't do 3D conformal there was something called 2.5D which was almost as good. You got good beams eye views, it was relatively available, it wasn't quite as accurate, and at that time what we call now IMRT was, had limited availability, it was mostly for, for research, for dose escalation studies, and on a scoring system, non-conformal, we say it's associated with more long-term side effects and poor results. So this is where we were, where nine is most appropriate, one is least appropriate, these are the guidelines that were published in the United States by the American College of, of Radiology. When, um, and in those days, um, when you look at um, the uh, imaging requirements, the standard of care was a port film once a week. So we used to treat patients where one time a week you would take an x-ray of what it is you were going to radiate. That was the standard of care. Daily monitoring was a research tool. And uh, treating only at the start was considered to be not adequate for definitive treatment. But there were a lot of problems with this standard of care back in uh, 2000 because patients would tell me this. They would say, Dr. Roach, how come on the day that they're going to check my port film, they spend more time positioning me on the table? 
And that was because if they took that image and it was off by a little bit, then they would have to take it again. So what would happen is they would take an x-ray of a picture of what they were going to radiate. And then they would take that film and they would stick it in the doctor's box. And I would come by and look at it and say, hey, this is off. Now, they already treated the patient, right? In some cases, this is like the, the later on. And then you tell them, make a move of five millimeters uh, to the left or right or front or back. Well, that was going to be implemented the next day. And then they would, might have to take that film again. So on the day that they checked the port film, they did not want to have to take another film. It was more work. And also, you know, it was a problem. But that meant those other four days, they put the patient on the table very quickly and treated them, and we had no documentation of what was actually being treated. And that was standard of care uh, back in those days. And I'll come back to, you know, where things are now. Also back around that time, we started looking at radiation doses. Many places were dose escalating. We had a dose escalation study. The bottom line is that what's become pretty standard is a dose of around 78 gray. It gives you better PSA control rates compared to 70 gray. Having said that, uh, this next slide summarizes almost every trial that was published looking at higher doses of radiation. And I know you probably can't read it from the back of the room. The point is that none of these studies show that higher doses make people live longer. That previous slide was a PSA endpoint. So if you got radiated to a higher dose, fewer men had a PSA that was drifting up a few years after treatment, but it didn't mean that people live longer. And in some cases, the patients had more complications. But the point was that in, the, in that trial uh, that was conducted at MD Anderson, that radiation was, they weren't using IMRT, they were using 3D for the boost part of the field. And they still, it still was reasonably well tolerated. They didn't use image guidance. And so you could, with, you could treat patients to 70 to 78 gray without IMRT if you use image guidance and if you use good margins, you can do it with 3D. The complication curve goes pretty steep once you get above a certain level, um, but uh, you definitely can do it. Now, there are a number of papers published. This is a curve that we generated using IMRT for rectal uh, doses, uh, where this top curve corresponds to studies that um, published that if you gave a dose to a certain percentage of the rectum above a certain level, you got rectal bleeding. If you use IMRT or fancy 3D, you can improve it by 10%, 20%, 25%, or 30%. So the point of this slide is really that if you understand how much rectum you can get away with radiating, then you can look at that before you treat a patient and determine whether this is acceptable or not and you can make appropriate changes um, and um, you know that's what you need to learn from other literature. Now one additional thing that can be done with 3D which again it depends on how you define 3D um, is that you can you could if you had a patient that has a lot of cancer in one lobe let's say all your biopsies are one part of the prostate. If you design, you can design even with 3D, even without IMRT, you can design radiation that will treat part of the prostate. You can do it fancier with IMRT, but this, so this is an example of a patient that we treated years ago where we were treating the left part of the prostate to a very high dose, 90 gray, and the right apex to 90 gray while treating the entire prostate to seven, uh, 76 gray. In this case, we compared various types of IMRT techniques, but technically, many people would consider this so-called static field IMRT a 3D conformal technique because it didn't use inverse planning. It didn't necessarily use multi-leaf. It could be done with blocks versus what would be called IMRT techniques by today's uh, terminology. So this 3D 
uh, sort of technique uh, could be used to generate very nice dose distributions comparable to uh, these other technologies that were used uh, to treat prostate cancer. And we quantified the dose to uh, the rectal wall for these various techniques and showed that it was, that it was uh, well tolerated. And this is just an example of the Peacock, which is the, was the first dedicated IMRT planning system. This is a, a modification of that. And this is basically a 3D technique, which doesn't show up well here. But the dose distributions were fairly similar between these. So it can be done. Now, I commented on the issue of what is IMRT. So we were asked uh, back uh, some, this is back in 2001, so more than 10 years ago, to uh, do the, the National Cancer Institute formed something called the IMRT Working Group. And our charge was to um, come up with what was IMRT, to define it. Now you have to understand that in the United States, there were two existing definitions of IMRT that were being developed at the same time we were developing a scientific de definition of IMRT there was a reimbursement definition, which was that in order to get paid for IMRT, you had to do a certain amount of QA. You had to do certain kinds of measurements. And you had to have IMRT equipment. And then you could bill for IMRT. And the bills were very high, so you could make a lot of money. It didn't say anything about the quality of the treatment. It didn't ensure that you were given the right dose. It didn't ensure right margins. It didn't ensure any of that. It just meant that you were taking, that you owned a piece of equipment that was capable of generating a certain type of radiation and that your physicist did some measurements on that equipment and then you could build the insurance company for IMRT. At the same time, the community has its own definition of IMRT, which again, they uh, assumed would require inverse planning. But the first debate that we had uh, is, is whether IMRT should require inverse planning. So I argued no, and some other people argued yes. So this has to deal with the whole idea of conventional radiation going to 3D conformal radiation, going to intensity modulated radiation as so this is how I learned to do radiotherapy. First conventional, then 3D, then IMRT. But there were other people who went straight from conventional radiation in a, what they called a paradigm shift directly to IMRT. They never did 3D conformal radiation. So they never went through the exercise of trying to figure out, well, what are the best beam angles? What are the best beam weights? And also, it became difficult to compare IMRT with old-fashioned radiation. So one of the advantages is that I knew what we did when I was a resident at Stanford with old-fashioned techniques. And so I could say, Dr. Bagshaw taught me that if you gave 70 gray at the ISO center with a 9 by 9 or an 8 by 8 feel, that this is tolerated. So I could then take that and design that technique, now use the same technique, but now quantify it with 3D. And then I could set dose constraints that I could then apply to IMRT. The problem is that some people went from conventional to IMRT, but they didn't know what dose constraints to use. Because when you use IMRT, you get hot spots in places that you never would see them with 3D conformal radiation. And because you were turning this over to dosimetrists, you weren't as actively involved in selecting the beam angles, the beam weights, and the margins. And also, it forced you to understand things about the anatomy that you didn't know before. But when you do IMRT, the concept of a margin is not the same as the concept of a margin when you do 3D or conventional radiation. Because you're really looking at dose distributions, not margins. So the conclusion, and actually, so this is a rare example where I actually won the debate because we showed that sometimes the 3D plan was superior to the IMRT plan. We could make a 3D plan that was better than the IMRT plan. And the other thing about IMRT, if you argue that you have to have inverse planning, 
it, then that means that if you do an IMRT plan and you look at it and then you change it, then that becomes what we call iterative, iterative planning, meaning that you're going back and forth. And if you're going back and forth, there's no longer purely inverse planning. You have a forward planning component to it. So it became a somatic argument. It wasn't purely inverse. Even in people that were doing IMRT, they would do inverse planning and then forward planning and then inverse planning. So it didn't make sense to argue that, you, that it had to be purely inverse planning uh, for it to, to, be, uh, to bring value with IMRT. So, there, so we came up with different types of IMRT, and they're sort of, most of them are sort of summarized here. Um, on this slide, the different types of IMRT. So actually, when uh, I tend to dis d d uh, disagree a little bit with, the, with John's description of you know, IMRT to VMAT, in fact, the NCI IMRT Working Group says all these things are various types of IMRT. This is what's commercially called a cyber knife, for example, is, is a robotic device, but it's still IMRT by the working group definition. Whether you use modulated arcs, whether you use segmental uh, planning or dynamic planning, or even forward plan, what some people were calling 3D, tomotherapy, there was a, there's a form of tomotherapy that used to be, that used to be with the Peacock device where it was uh, serial, meaning that it would deliver a dose around a, a ring and then the table would be indexed. And then the next slice would be treated and then another form of tomotherapy that was a spiral tomotherapy, which is what we use now for what's called commercially the tomotherapy machine. So this, this tomotherapy is not the commercial tomotherapy machine. This is the type of IMRT that delivers a treatment in a circular sort of system that has built-in imaging to accompany that. So these are all different flavors of what could be called IMRT. And it's not that one of them is better than another. It depends on what you're doing with it. Now the, the so-called step and shoot IMRT example is sort of shown on this slide. You have multi-leafs of a certain shape. They deliver a dose that's here. The next set of leaves are here. A third of the dose is delivered this way. The next set of leaves come in and the dose is delivered here. They result in this. And then you have a composite of all of these that form a dose distribution. So it doesn't matter whether this is done with the machine going around. It does, I mean, at the end of the day, this is where you want to be. And it can be done many different ways. Uh, and this is just an example of how these leaves are sometimes used. And I showed the example earlier where we were using three different techniques we set the same constraints. We wanted the base lesion to receive 90 gray. We wanted the apex to receive 90 gray. We wanted to not exceed the tolerance to the rectum and the bladder. And it didn't matter whether we did sequential tomotherapy, inverse SMLC, or forward plan segmental multi-leaf collimated treatment. This would, some people would call 3D. Um, all of these are capable of meeting the dose constraints. But the big problem, and really the next big thing that happened after 3D was not so much IMRT, at least when it comes to prostate, was the issue of organ motion and day-to-day -day setup variation. So we did, a, we did uh, after Randy Tinhocken um, did the work early on, we did a series of studies. We took patients. This is a, these are uh, different patients, and what we did is we, every couple of weeks we did a noose cat scan and we looked at where the prostate was. So in this particular patient, compared to his baseline cat scan, his prostate moved 0.75 cm forward. In this patient, his moved 0.75 posterior. And this one moved a centi over a centimeter. This one was in the same position all the time on the, the other scans. Uh, and so you can see that there's a lot of this patient, number nine, the prostate was always in the same position relative to all the scans. So this became a huge issue. I showed you earlier that you want to use a tight margin on the back of the prostate and a big margin on the front of the prostate. So then some people said, why don't we use an ultrasound machine to do that? So they created a system called the BAT system. And this was an uh, ultrasound system that was put on the abdomen to image the prostate each day before each treatment. 
And at our national meetings, I remember a very famous uh, radiation oncologist got up who treats prostate cancer and swore that this was extremely important for improving the accuracy of treatment. Um, we had a poster at the same meeting that showed that it didn't work so good. And the problem, the reason it didn't work so good was that there was the inter-observer variability because you're asking therapists to figure out where the prostate is. Here's the bladder, here's the prostate, seminal vesicles, and rectum, but you can see these are pretty fuzzy looking pictures. So the way that they had done this at this, uh, this famous radiation oncologist had done their research is the therapist would make the adjustment and then the doctor would come by and look at the adjustment made and say, that looks fine. And they had a 90% agreement rate. So 90% of the time when the doctor came along and looked at this ultrasound image, he said, oh yeah, that's good, go ahead and treat. But we did, a different, we did it a different way. We took the patient and we had each person independently without knowledge of what the other person was doing figure out where they thought the prostate was located. And it turned out that there was significant variability. Sometimes there would, the prostate would be perfectly aligned and, the, and we would end up moving it. And we had a world famous ultrasonographer involved. We had several physicians who had ex experts having done hundreds of implants looking at ultrasound images. And the problem was still there. The fact is that it wasn't very reliable. And this is just showing the scatter of different measurements. The, this bat is the ultrasound device showing the scatter from these different people. There were four radiation oncologists, a urologist, therapists, and two physicists, and there was no consistency that this technology wasn't very good at doing that. And the way that we proved that it didn't work was some technology which we did come to favor, which is to use an electronic portal imaging system that allowed us to pick up small seeds. So we started to routinely place these seeds in the prostate prior to treatment. So this is an example of a patient. Uh, this is a digitally reconstructed radiograph, and we put in, we had the urologist put in three seeds. There's a seed here and two seeds here, and if you can, and the light is tough to see, but there's a seed here and two seeds here, and every day prior to each treatment, we would then reposition the patient to make sure that it's very accurate. So this is an actual image of a patient with the seeds there, and we could reposition the patient with every treatment and uh, the patient can be treated within within two millimeters. So this is a very important step forward. This was more important for treating prostate cancer than IMRT. Once you got 3D where you can figure out where the rectum is and the bladder and you could spare those and you figured out the dose of radiation that you needed was in the range of 70 to 78 gray. If you were hitting the prostate and avoiding the normal tissues then there was a good chance that it was going to be done accurately by being able to use this technology. And we showed that if you took patients, this is looking at this red, this is, a, this is the distribution of posterior to anterior. If, um, you know, if you didn't do anything, you can see that it would be off, it's wider. But if you adjusted for it, then you could make this you could bring the shape of this curve in, which reflects the fact that you can be consistently more accurate in terms of your delivery. And also, the seeds did not generally migrate. If you put these seeds in the prostate, they didn't go someplace else. And this is just showing that within a few, within a millimeter, basically almost all, except for rare errors in measurement, um, this was done well below two millimeters in terms of being able to accurately figure out uh, the, 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 the seed relationship to one another. And in, in, a, in, a, in a paper that was the first paper we ever wrote in which there was no critique. Usually when I submit a paper, the reviewers say, oh, I want you to do this, I want you to change this, I want you to change this. This is a paper that we wrote that only had three patients in it. <laughs> and they accepted it with no revisions. These are patients that were morbidly obese. So if you take a patient who's morbidly obese, the traditional way we used to treat patients with radiation is we would put tattoos on the skin. And then you put the laser beam on the skin. But if a person's morbidly obese, you can move the skin wherever you want. So you cannot reproducibly reposition the patient. And we showed that if you did not use the gold seeds, 
that you couldn't accurately treat these patients. And this is just showing that in these three patients, this is uh, uh, um, su superior to inferior, right to left, and ant to post. The biggest problem was what we call setup error related to positioning. So sometimes the, uh, the error would be five centimeters. So you, would, you, could, you could actually miss the prostate. I mean, like completely miss the prostate if you use tattoos and a patient is morbidly obese. So with three patients, you can show that it, so the point of our paper was, if you have a morbidly obese patient, you must use gold seeds or some type of online imaging to ensure that the treatment is delivered accurately. And that's, this is just showing that, um, you know, the range of measurements. Now, there were some people who said um, that you don't need to image every day prior to each treatment. You can just image, you can just image the first few treatments and then that will give you an idea of what the rest of the treatments were like. So there was one institution in particular that wrote a series of papers saying we just imaged the first five days and then we use that to define the treatment. And this is just showing what happens when you do that. You can see this is the range of residual errors. And just remember how wide this looks. And then this is a paper that was done at the University of Michigan showing that if you, but if you adjust every day, that range becomes very tight. So in fact, they show that you do need to image every day. You can't just image the first five days and assume that that's going to tell you the rest of the time. You really need to every, image every day prior to each treatment. So if you develop a planning, if you have radiation equipment, regardless whether it's gantry or no gantry, regardless of whether it's 3D, or not 3D or IMRT, if I was gonna have one thing and I was treating patients with curative intent, you wanna make sure you hit the target. So then we come to 2010. I showed you earlier that 3D was standard of care and 2.5D was second and IMRT was a research. Well, in the United States it's become, again, the, the previous number shown, the old number there, became eight, which means it became the standard of care driven primarily by financial issues. Um, but nonetheless, it was a step forward. It is a little bit better. It does uh, have some uh, flexibility. It's actually faster. It's easier for me to do an IMRT plan than a 3D plan because our therapists are doing so many IMRT plans and we have a standardized set of beam angles and beam weights. So you can develop what we call a class solution. If you're treating a lot of cervix cancer, or breast cancer, or head and neck cancer, or prostate cancer, you don't start from scratch. You start off with class solutions. You develop a standard technique. You use six fields, or seven fields, or eight fields, whatever you decide. But again, you don't want to start from scratch. You want to read what's in the literature, copy it, tweak it to meet your needs, and then make sure that you hit the right spot. And then, instead of taking a port film, weekly port film dropped way down. We said daily online imaging became the standard of care, no longer a research tool. If you don't have daily imaging, you can use a rectal balloon. We don't like them, but some people do. You can use the ultrasound. I consider that better than nothing, but it wasn't terribly accurate. And weekly port films were unacceptable. And the port film at the beginning became unacceptable. So these guidelines uh, have evolved over time. And uh, there was some discussion earlier about, about, uh, about uh, guidelines and standards of treatment. Uh, I think that there are plenty of opportunities to develop ones that are unique to the environment here. So, uh, what is 3D as opposed to IMRT? Not everybody agrees. It's certainly not cheaper. Uh, it's, uh, and if you have 3D, you can deliver the doses of radiation that you need to for prostate cancer. There's no good evidence that your patient is going to live longer because you go to higher doses, so not necessarily. Again, 78 gray is probably a reasonable dose. I think the next speaker who's going to talk about the treatment of prostate cancer in a broader sense will talk about hormone therapy, but I showed you a slide that showed that higher doses of radiation didn't make people live longer from prostate cancer. But there's a whole lot of studies that show that adding hormonal therapy to radiation results in people living longer from prostate cancer. Uh, so I think that's something to keep in mind. 
accuracy, which I consider to be improved with image guidance, with the use of gold marker seeds in particular, is, is more important than dose, or at least as important than dose. And uh, what is the standard of care? Well, document, documentation is really where we are. Make sure that you keep track of what you're doing so that if you're doing something wrong, you can figure that out, but also uh, quality requires you to be able to track uh, what you're doing. And my last slide is the wise boldly pick up a truth as soon as they hear it. I think that 3D conformal radiation, if that's what you have, can be used very well to treat prostate cancer. Um, I think that daily image guidance is one of the most important steps. I think in a country where, where you, uh, uh, film is going to be expensive and developing chemicals is going to be expensive and the cost, I think a, an electronic portal imaging system is probably going to end up being cheaper in the long run and be critical to, uh, to improving the quality of treatment. I'll stop there and take questions.